This video is for entertainment and educational purposes only. All right, guys, today on the anabolic Q&A, we have Trin on a maintenance diet. Thoughts on alternating MK677 with HGH. Can you still get LVH even if you reduce risk factors? When to bump calories in a bulk? How many grams of protein can you digest in a setting? When estrogen is too high? GH on a budget. Why are orals stronger than injectables milligram for milligram? Why strong men aren't dying like bodybuilders? Thoughts on high fat diets. All right, guys, first question I have here is from Paz Paz, and he asked, what about Tren on a maintenance phase? You said Tren is good at gaining muscle on a calorie deficit. How about using Tren when we are in a maintenance phase on maintenance calories to get those Tren gains? All right, so here's my thought on that. Uh, we really have three phases that we deploy throughout the year as physique athletes. Phase one is our hypertrophy phase. Our hypertrophy phase is when we are pushing the gas pedal down for growth. We are pushing calories up incrementally. We're pushing the weight training intensity up incrementally, and we are pushing the gear up incrementally to add new tissue. Uh, we have our uh, contest prep phase. Um, our contest prep phase, our objective there is to get rid of body fats while maintaining as much of that hard earned muscle that we gained in the off season as possible. And then there's our maintenance phase. What is the goal of the maintenance phase? Nobody ever thinks about this. So for me, the maintenance phase, when I am training, my maintenance phase, the, which is when I cruise, the maintenance phase is to eliminate systemic stress. It is to reduce stress on the body, uh, organ stress, to reduce stress on the joints, to reduce stress on the connective tissue and the muscle tissue, to let your body recover and to be ready for the next phase. So keeping that in mind, TREN is one of the most toxic compounds that we use. TREN causes a lot of stress, even at low doses. We are not trying to gain muscle in the, in the maintenance phase. We're getting greedy. We're, we're, we're going to be sacrificing, um, something, you know, big for just a small gain. Let's say we, we maybe gain a half a pound of muscle in an eight week or 12 week cruise from, from adding trend to it. That does not seem worth it to me. You're adding, you're adding stress. You're, you're not seeing the forest for the trees. So. My answer is don't do it. Save trend for contest prep. Occasionally I, I would use trend towards the end of a off season blast for body composition purposes, but very rarely I probably wouldn't do that at this phase in my life. Maybe when I was younger I would, but not now. Abdullah asked, what are your thoughts on alternating MK677 with HGH on all alternating days? Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the purpose is of doing that. Um, I don't know if you're trying to save your body. Um, you know, I know, I know some dudes have this thought that, you know, I'll keep my, keep my natural H, uh, GH production going while supplementing GH. I, I think you're just sending mixed signals to the body and, and running a yo-yo, or it could be just to save money. I don't know. Here's my thing. If you're going to run GH, run GH. If you're going to run MK677, run MK677. When you're constantly back and forth between stuff, this is one of the things that drives me nuts on cycles when I do help guys out with cycles is when they're constantly changing things and making multiple changes at one time. If you have multiple variables, you don't know what's working. You have no clue. You're just guessing. Um, and there's also with MK677, I personally stay away from it. Um, it is a drug candidate. It has not been approved for human use. Everybody poo-poos me when I talk about using EQ. Um, uh, 
EQ has a long track record of use in humans. While it hasn't been studied or approved for human use, um, uh, you know, or it actually has been studied, but it hasn't been you know, approved. We, we know what we're getting with EQ. All right, there, there's, you know, a good 40, 50 years worth of data. There is not that for MK677. It might be fine. It might cause serious issues down the road. Plus, we know GH works. GH has been studied inside and out. It's relatively safe. We know what the risks are. We know how to mitigate those risks. Just use GH. And if you don't have the money to use GH, don't use anything. Jonathan asks, can you still develop LVH, left ventricular hypertrophy, when blasting high doses of gear, even if you're taking proactive measures to manage the risks, such as taking telmosartan? Um, you know, managing your lipids, etc. Um, yeah, it's still possible. I mean, what you know, you yeah, of course. Uh, when you're a big person, LVH is probably unavoidable to a certain degree. I, I, you know, when I had my last echo done, the doctor said I had a slight L, uh, left ventricular hip, you know, enlargement. He said it was pretty normal for my size. He wouldn't, he said I wouldn't lose any sleep over it. So we see it commonly in athletes, but there was a slight enlargement. So I, I stay on top of it. I manage it. I, I get it checked, you know, once or twice a year, um, just to keep an eye on it. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. You you have you know body weight. It was probably you know body mass is probably a huge factor in it. You know while we can re reduce the risk by managing blood pressure. Uh, keeping our hematocrit in, tr in check. Another another thing that you know guys don't think about too is uh, sleep apnea plays a role in it as well. Uh, you know, so yeah, absolutely, it, it still can happen, and you uh, you need to pay attention to it. That's why you need to go get diagnostic testing done every once in a while. Get an echo done to make sure that things are okay. You don't have to do it all the time. Every couple of years is probably fine. I know they're expensive. Um, if you can get your insurance to cover it, great. Uh, if you have an FSA, you can pay for it with your FSA, but uh, just keep an eye on it. It absolutely still can happen, even though you reduce risk. It's like asking, you know, hey, if I wear a helmet and a jacket and drive my motorcycle responsibly, can I still die in a motorcycle wreck? Of course you can. You've lowered the risk. You've greatly lowered the risk, but there's still risk. So we're still engaging in a dangerous activity that carries risk with it of um, serious up, you know, consequences. So yeah, it still exists, even though you reduce it, it's a reduced risk, but the risk is still there. And if you're worried about it, then probably stay away from running high doses of gear. All right. Ali asked, how many sets total do I do during a workout? Well, it really depends on what phase I am in. Uh, we talked earlier about the three phases we have. We have, uh, the hypertrophy phase, the off season phase, as we call it in bodybuilding. We have our maintenance phase, which is our stress reduction phase. And then we have our contest prep, which is our fat loss phase. Um, so volume uh, will be adjusted up and down to manage fatigue. If, if too much fatigue is accumulated, the adding more volume is pointless. You're just digging yourself into a hole you can't recover from, making things worse. Um, so we have to manage volume with that in mind. So. Uh, thinking about that when I am in the off season, when sleep is better, uh, we're, um, uh, hypercaloric, we're eating more food than we're, you know, we're eating more food than we're burning. Uh, we're escalating gear, uh, running less toxic gear. Um, I, you can tolerate more volume. So volume ratchets up in the off season. And that's when we hit our our maximum volume. I will push volume. I run six week blocks of training usually is how I do it. And I'll start off at a minimum effective volume. I, I, I do sort of a Renaissance periodization type of program. I wouldn't say it's exactly a Renaissance period, periodization, but it is inspired by that type of program. Um, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Mike Israel and Brad Schoenfeld and, you know, these high volume programs, but I ratchet up the, uh, the volume and the intensity over a six week block. And then we'll back off, deload, reset, do it again. Um, so it just depends. Like, you know, in the off season when I am, you know, f you know, fully fueled and reco you know, recovery is good, I I'll push up, you know, on some of my larger body parts, legs, maybe 25 sets a week. Chest, you know, 20 sets a week, something like that. Um, it just depends on the body part. Different, you, you have to kind of feel out what works for you. I wish I, there was a prescribed number. 
if you go on the Renaissance Periodization site, uh, Mike has a rep or a uh, volume rep range up and uh, for you know specific body parts, but it really varies from person to person, and you have to gauge it. Like during contest prep, I my my volume is probably about a third lower, um, and then on a maintenance phase, I probably run half the volume that I do, which would be minimum effective volume, as they call it in the Renaissance uh, program where you're just basically maintenance volume enough to keep muscle on. Um, so that's that's kind of how I do it. I wish I could give you a set number of sets that I run, but it, it, it varies. And you have to listen to your body and let your body tell you what you can do. Next question is for, from Furkan. He asks, when do you bump calories in the off season? Let's say that your weights and strength are going up, but your body weight is not going up. Do you increase calories? No, I don't usually. I, I, I'll be honest with you, um, it is a bit subjective. I let body composition dictate that, you know, obviously we're gonna accumulate some body fat in the off season, that's just how it goes. You have to gain some body fat to gain muscle tissue, but we want to minimize that. Um, and, you know, when I'm working with clients, I keep an eye on how they're responding. And I take a look, you know, I, I listen to things, I keep track of, uh, you know, um, glucose sensitivity. If glucose sensitivity is gone to shit, then I probably have pushed my food up too much. I need to back off a little bit. That's another factor you have to consider when pushing food. Um, you know, if you're running, you know, pre-diabetic insulin or, you know, pre-diabetic uh, blood sugar levels and your insulin sensitivity is a shit, there's no point in eating any more food. Your, your body's not even utilizing it. Um, and uh, so, you know, if somebody is looking good, their body composition looks decent. I don't see it taking a quick turn for the worse and they're not gaining. I will push food. I, I, I get aggressive with it, but we make inter incremental small changes. You know, it might be, you know, 30, 40 grams of carbs added each week. Carbs are kind of the wild card. Generally, I keep uh, protein static and fats pretty much static. Sometimes fats will go up and down, but you don't need a ton of fats in a body composition um, type style diet. Like, even in the off season, you don't need a ton of fats. Um, uh, fats really don't contribute much to uh, a physique athlete beyond a certain point. EPF 55 asks, how much protein can be digested in one set setting, in, uh, assuming that I'm alternating food sources, uh, going from eggs to beef to uh, whey powder? How much protein do you think you can adjust in one setting? I, you know, I've read extensively about it. There's a bunch of different theories on it, but I, you know, it seems like there's no really set upper limit of it. I mean, in your body, you know, when it gets to the point where it can't utilize it, it just either converts it to glucose through gluconeogenesis or just, you know, you just end up fucking pissing it out. Uh, so, um, I don't know. I mean, there's not, you know, there, you, you look at studies, um, I th if, if my memory serves me correctly, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but if memory serves me, I recall seeing that 0.7 grams per pound of body weight is what they had established is what you need to effectively weight train. Um, I err on the side of caution with physique athletes because most of us are enhanced. Um, you know, so there's increased muscle protein synthesis from the from the PEDs and, uh, you know, and plus just the fact that protein is satiating. So, you know, especially when you're on contest prep, you may even want to increase protein a little bit just to keep full. Um, you know, it's not so much that there's some magic in it. You really don't need a lot of protein to uh, stimulate muscle protein synthesis. The more important thing is, is that you have amino acids protein present at all times because you never know when muscle protein synthesis is going to happen so that's more important than actually how much you can digest per meal um, so you want to keep a steady influx of slow digesting proteins that's why I kind of steer away from whey protein because it digests so quickly it doesn't keep a steady level of amino acids present in the blood uh, it's in and out of you super quick uh, you know I, I do eat protein powder now and then I know I give guys shit for it but some dudes treat it like it's their part-time job and really what it boils down to is just they're too lazy to food prep. <laughs> it's it's easier just to slam a protein shake. And um, lazy people drive me nuts. <laughs> so that's what it, what, it, what it boils down to at the end of the day. Tyler asks, is high estrogen a problem if you don't have any symptoms? 
Um, no, I don't think so. Not at least not in a off-season hypertrophy phase. If you're on contest prep, we do want to push, um, you know, suppress estrogen a bit for body composition purposes. Uh, but in the off-season, I let my estrogen ride as high as I possibly can uh, tolerate w without using an anti-estrogen. For me, I, I found that 750 milligrams of test is about as high as I can push and not take an AI. Um, and I, I have noticed, too, as I've gotten older, that my it, it doesn't seem like I convert estrogen as heavily as I used to. I think part of it is I'm leaner than I used to be. Um, and I also noticed, and this is a weird thing, I think I, I don't remember what podcast I heard somebody talking about this. Maybe it was uh, More Plates, More Dates. I, I don't remember. But I, after gyno surgery, and I, I'm glad somebody else brought this up, after I had gyno surgery and had my gyno removed, um, I noticed that uh, my estradiol doesn't run as high. So I don't know if the glandular tissue com contributes to aromatase production or something. I, maybe. I, I don't know. I, I need to look into... Look at if somebody knows, you know, please comment in the comment section. But um, you know, and it could be just that my body has changed as I've gotten older. But I don't seem to aromatize as heavily as I used to. When I was younger, it was crazy. Just the slightest bit of test in my. I, I remember. I remember one time I took like it was just two fifty tests, and my my estrogen levels were like three hundred. <laughs> it was something crazy. And I've seen people all over the place. I've seen you know. I look at people's blood work. I had a dude the other day. It's running 750 tests. It is in no AI, and his his uh, his estradiol was like 30. And then you know, then I had another dude that was uh, you know running TRT, and it was like 400. So you know, certainly body fat plays a role in it. The higher, the worse your body composition, the higher your estrogen goes. But I let my estrogen run as high as I can because estrogen is neuroprotective. It is cardioprotective. It also helps with hypertrophy. It, 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 it aids in growth. So in the off-season, we want to let it ride as high as you can tolerate, as long as you're not getting gyno, as long as your sex drive hasn't gone to shit, sleep's okay. I just, I just let it ride. That's my two cents. All right, Vanilla Gorilla asked, he said, on the average meathead's budget, who can only afford to maybe run a couple units of gh a day is gh actually worth running or would that money be better spent on more um more anabolic steroids all right so this one this one drives me nuts i get guys who reach out to me all the fucking time i i don't know it's kind of a pet peeve uh, that asks me for coaching advice but then don't want to fucking pay for coaching but they're talking about running gh and i'm like dude you you can afford to buy GH, but you can't afford to spend one hundred and twenty dollars a month on coaching. <laughs> hey, if you don't know how to use it, then you're wasting your money anyway. So, I don't know. My 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 two cents. I think the best bang for your buck, if if you can only afford two units of GH, take that money. And I'm not saying hire me, but get somebody that knows what the fuck they're doing with diet, PEDs training and that'll get you in shape and spend that money on them i do i, I i've all i've always had a coach and i've learned so much i'm paying some of that forward now to you guys you know spend the money and, and have a coach to help you that's my two cents um two units of gh isn't going to make much of a difference i mean as you get older it, you know for anti-aging purposes yeah but that as far as performance enhancing goes I, you're not going to get much out of two units of GH for performance enhancing purposes. You know, it's decent for anti-aging, maybe for joint health. Um, but I probably wouldn't waste my money on two units of GH. That's just my two cents. Um, uh, it depends on your age, too. You know, if you're in your 20s, you really don't need GH. I don't have guys in their 20s run GH. I just think it's probably, a, you know, maybe on contest prep, but they, they don't need it. Um, but anyway, that's my two cents. Save the money on the GH and hire a good coach so you get the most out of what you're doing. Peter asks, why are orals so strong? Well, I mean, they're methylated. <laughs> That's why. He asked why they're so strong compared to uh, compounds. Like you, he said, I talked about, um, I don't remember, but I, I'm constantly comparing EQ and D-ball to each other because molecularly EQ and D-ball are the same thing minus the 17 alpha alkylation. 
Um, and I know people get pissed off when I say, you know, don't take D-ball, take EQ again. Instead, people are like, oh, they're not the same thing. I'm like, I get it, I get it. I know the the uh, the 17 alpha alkylation <laughs> makes it strong. Really, what, what what the methylation does is is bring out all the worst effects of it. It does make it stronger, but it, it to me it just seems like in most cases it just makes the the molecule worse. It, it, it enhances all. It not only enhances the effects, it enhances all the fucking side effects too. It makes all all, all the worst side effects. So. My point is, is why take that shit when you can fucking take EQ, you know, trashy-ass, trashy-ass D-ball versus EQ. Um, I mean, that's why, but the thing is, is, like, you gotta think about with orals, like, guys talk about how strong they are, that while they are strong, you can't, you can't run two grams of orals a week. I mean, I guess you could. I mean, I, I've heard of dudes running 150 milligrams of Anadrol all day, but if you want to shit out your liver, go for it. You want 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 to have your um, HDL be zero? <laughs> you can go right for it. If you want to manifest a liver tumor, uh, you know, sure, go for it. <laughs> but you know, that's my two cents. I don't know. I I you know, I'm not completely anti-oral. I think there are situations strategically when you can deploy them, but you know, save them for those situations. But yeah, it's the it's the methylation of it that makes it stronger. It changes the prop properties of the compound. All right, last one here. DMG Gaming uh, ask, uh, with all the bodybuilders falling over from heart attacks, strokes, dying recently, why don't you see strongman falling over? They're big. They use PEDs. They don't seem to be dying like bodybuilders do. Uh, I remember back in the day, there were a lot of uh, strongman that died. I can't remember the guy's name, but it was back in the late 90s. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember the guy's name. I don't want to say the wrong name and be wrong about it, but um, it, he was uh, he was a, a Norwegian guy, if I remember right, but it, he was like 32 or something and fucking died of a heart attack. Um, I can't remember his name. I, I, I remember he was like purple from Anadrol all the time. <laughs> Um, but no, you bring up a good point. Um, I, you know, and, I, and I'm sure that there have been plenty of strongmen that ha have died. You just don't hear about it. Um, you know, there are only a few famous strongmen. The rest of them, nobody, they aren't social media superstars. Like, like bo every bodybuilder seems to be this day. Um, you know, everybody's like honed in on bodybuilders. I'm sure there are plenty of middle age or 50 year old strongmen that die. I, a friend of mine that's a doctor said, he said, you see a lot of, you said you'll see big people, you'll see old people, but you don't see a lot of old big people. It doesn't matter if you're fat or if you're big, you know, it, it, you, you just don't, you know, when you're 400 pounds, you're not going to live to be 70 plus years old. Just doesn't happen. When was the last time you saw a 400 pound 70 year old? They don't exist. It doesn't matter if it's muscle. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, I, I do know too, from talking to straw men, they don't run near as much gear as bodybuilders do. Not even a fraction of what bodybuilders do. I mean, a lot of the straw men, I, 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 I'm not going to name a name, but I know a guy that is a close to being a world or he might even be a world record holder now. I don't know. But, uh, um, and dude's running under a gram of gear when he's prepping for, um, prepping for a straw man competition. Hell, I, you know, I'm running twice that <laughs> <laughs> uh, getting ready for a local bodybuilding show you know masters division so you know they don't run as much gear now they do strong men have a history of eating shitty diets they used to eat shitty high fat diets um you know and they don't seem to be doing that anymore um so yeah there there is that factor as well um you know so I now also I think Stan Efforting has gotten a hold of a lot of these guys he's got a lot of these guys doing vertical diet now you know you see guys like Eddie Hall I know he must have had some sort of health scare recently because um, I saw him like talking about losing weight and cleaning up his diet. Same thing with uh, um, Half Thor, cleaned up his diet, dropped a bunch of weight. So clearly these guys are paying closer attention to their health than they used to. They don't run as much gear and it's probably a healthier lifestyle. I don't think people, I think the part that really destroys bodybuilders health is contest prep. That's the part that's really stressful on your body uh, is contest prep. You, you're just, you're not supposed to be 250 pounds and, 
and 4% body fat and you have to do some really extreme things to make that happen and really unhealthy things to make that happen. All right guys, last question here. I forgot to write down this dude's name. Um, he, uh, we, we exchanged some debate on the uh, comment section of one of my videos and he was asking me why I poo poo um, high fat diets all the time and that he's saying that a lot of the new studies and stuff are showing that uh, there may not be uh, a link between high fat diets and, and cardiovascular disease. First of all, I disagree with that, but <laughs> um, you know, here's the thing with studies on, on, on nutrition. It's almost impossible to control for and get an accurate study on nutrition. A lot of it is speculative and we're, we're using correlation to come up with these, these uh, you know, the theories and results because the only way you could really, really uh, get an effective study would be to lock people in a room and give them a controlled diet for years on end and monitor every ounce of food that goes in and out of their mouth and see what the results are over over many years of feeding them and you can't do that that that's that's unrealistic you know so we we can approximate by using rats but rats aren't fucking people uh we know that we see that that it doesn't always you know it's, it gives us an approximation but it doesn't always give us uh um you know high you know the 100 percent degree of confidence but what we here's the facts here's what we do know and uh, correl you know, there is a correlation between high fat diets and cardiovascular disease. It is a direct correlation. I'll, I'll, I will concede that uh, correlation is not causation, okay? But this is the best that we have to go on. There is a strong correlation between high fat diets and increased risk of cardiovascular disease. There is also a strong correlation between low fat, low cholesterol diets and low risk of cardiovascular disease. I've even seen some situations where people uh, will remove, I think it's Dr. Conrad Esselton, I read his book a while ago, where he put this people on, these guys on the extreme diets, I think Bill Clinton was one of them, um, where he's a, he's a researcher at the Cleveland Clinic. But he put basically people on a almost fat-free diet, um, as low fat as they possibly could get. Basically, they just ate beans and kale. And these people were actually reversed um, arteriosclerosis and blockages uh, over a period of time. And, and, and basically, none of these people had further cardiovascular events. These were people that already had, had cardiovascular events. Um, and it essentially cured cardiovascular disease from removing fats from the diet. So you tell me. Um, um, you know, <laughs> there, there is definitely a risk factor. I've also seen it myself over and over and over again. I, I work with dudes that run keto diets. I work with these dudes that have run, um, these high fat carnivore diets. And when I see their lipids, their lipids are through the fucking roof. Um, you know, it, it, so it definitely has an impact on your lipids. Uh, and so we know from study after study after study that high lipids, do increase, you know, there is a correlation between high lipids, uh, worsened lipid profiles, and cardiovascular disease. Okay, so, you know, if you're in a bubble and you're not eating a, or you're not a bodybuilder, you're not a performance athlete taking PEDs, you might be able to get away with it. You might have some sort of genetic, um, you know, polymorphism where, where you could eat, you can have high lipids or you can eat a high fat diet and, and get away with it and not end up with, with plaque buildup or, a, or cardiovascular events. But if you're taking PEDs, we know that PEDs greatly exacerbate all of that, especially dudes that are pounding orals. Just take a look at Cali Muscle. I, I laugh at that dude. He blames everybody um, you know, or blame steroids for, for his heart attack, but then he's got pictures of him sitting in front, in front of fucking buckets of chicken and fast food. Dude, that's not what caused your coronary artery block. The steroids weren't what caused your coronary artery blockage. It was the buckets of chicken you were eating. Coronary artery blockages are almost, are 100% are diet related, almost always diet related. Uh, and can be controlled with diet and people that keep their cholesterol. I, I don't remember the LDL like I think it was below 70 if your LDL is below 70 like you won't have um, I don't cut me on that number so if I'm wrong about that But people that keep their LDL low enough don't have coronary artery blockages. So clearly Clearly there is something to that
Okay, so if you're eating something like a carnivore diet or a keto diet and you're slamming PEDs on top of it and probably not doing cardio because we know like strength athletes don't like to do cardio, you are greatly increasing your risk of cardiova uh, a cardiovascular event. I don't care what anybody says. And a lot of the people that are citing these studies are these dudes that are shucking these fad diets, trying to sell you their book, trying to sell you their plan. Um, I, I, I think a lot of these guys are just fucking charlatans. That's my two cents. All right, guys, that's all I got for you today. Hopefully you enjoyed this Q&A. Thank you for watching. I greatly appreciate each and every one of you.